I want to talk to you about the privilege of having studied mathematics and the opportunities it has given me. Many of you in this room, I know, are studying mathematics or a related STEM field, and uh, I just want to tell you, I think you're really lucky to be studying those things, and I want to tell you a little bit about why I have found math so important to my life, my career, and, uh, and the opportunities that I have had. And I'm going to do that by just kind of walking you through some of the things I've had the opportunity to do. And I want to start with why did I get into math and what was my, uh, what was my reason. And the reason was that my father encouraged me. My father said to me when I was considering what should I major in when I go to college, he said, you're good at math, major in math, because if you can do the math, you can do anything. So, this is a picture of an admiral named Hyman Rickover. Have any of you heard of Admiral Hyman Rickover? All right, great, lots of people have. For those of you who haven't, Admiral Rickover is the father of nuclear power in this country, and particularly in the U.S. Navy. And my father was a young enlisted officer who really wanted to be in the nuclear power program. In order to get into the nuclear power program, you had to interview with the formidable Admiral Rickover. And to understand just how formidable that interview was, if you pay close attention to that chair, you may notice that the two front legs are just a little shorter than the two back legs. And that was because he wanted you to be uncomfortably sliding forward the entire time he's asking you questions to see if you can maintain your composure under his grilling in this situation not easy. Okay, my dad passed. He got through it and then he got to nuclear power school and my father had a high school education and not much math and he did really well but he worked really hard on the math and he, that's where it came from. If you can do the math, you can do anything because my father, he mastered the math but it wasn't easy for him because he didn't have that understanding. But he went on to be a very successful nuclear engineer in the Navy. And I learned quickly that I do indeed love math. So I was lucky enough to get a job right out of uh, my undergraduate school and I went to night school to get my master's degree. My first jobs in, uh, in applying my mathematics was in the area of computers and computer programming. Not computer science, I know there's lots of computer scientists in the room as well, but just doing programs with my computer. And I know that there are people in this audience that are gifted at that and I envy you. Boy do I envy you because I am not gifted at computer programming. So I'm sitting in my office and I'm looking at my computer and I am trying to, com to, to master my programs and find the bugs in my complex code and I wasn't very happy. And I realized that, you know, this could be the rest of my life. And all of a sudden I had sort of a crisis of faith. Oh my goodness, have I studied the wrong thing? Have I learned the wrong thing? And I had a, a wonderful friend who advised me and said, no, no, it's not the math. It's how you're applying it right now and you, you as a person. So you've got to figure out how to apply it that's good for, for you. So I had the opportunity at that point to change and do some different kinds of work. And this work was on large joint operational tests. So this was for the Defense Department, and this was a time in the Cold War when all the, the military departments, so the Army and the Air Force, for example, would come together on, on large, huge bases with huge number of assets, like planes and tanks and all different kinds of things, to try to come together and over a series of experiments, figure out how to solve a problem, how to defeat a potential uh, enemy tactic, or how to deal with a, a just a, a really challenging operational problem. And so I had the opportunity now to not just fight with my computer program that I'm not good at, but to talk to people out in the field doing real work to try to understand how to be a better operator. Now, the math background that I had at this time, in, uh, and I had an, op um, an operations math background, so I had statistics and operations research, that was really helpful in designing these experiments. But the really interesting thing that I learned early is that 
these guys, they don't care very much about statistical significance. These guys care about living, dying, and doing their mission. And for them to get all those assets together in one place and have an opportunity to use them to experiment on how to survive better and be more effective in your mission, they don't want to do anything the same way twice, let alone enough times to get statistical significance. <laughs> but my bosses, back in my home organization at this point, it was the Institute for Defense Analyses, a fabulous organization, but they wanted statistical significance. So my job was to go out there and convince them to, to run the same thing over and over and over so that our math would add up to statistically significant results. Now operators are looking at me and saying, my gas, my planes, forget it, right? And, and you know what I realized? I realized they're kind of right. Why should me, as a math analyst, try to drive them to behave in a way that wasn't going to help them be the best at what they do, which is volunteer to serve our country and put their lives at risk in the process? So I had the opportunity to figure out how to work between the two worlds, between them and what they were having to try to do, and what we could say mathematically from the results of what they did, even though they wouldn't do it the same way every time. Didn't mean we couldn't learn. It didn't mean we couldn't extract things. It didn't mean we couldn't do analysis on, on the math that came out of it. It did mean that we weren't going to get the statistical significance that you might want if you were going to hang your hat on something. And so this was my first taste at understanding what became a passion for me, which is operations analysis. It's not operations research. It's not statistics. But it pulls on both and every other kind of math that I can think of to try to understand how to actually help people do better through math. And that was my first beginning of doing that work in these large joint tests. So I found out, OK, this is my passion. This is what I love to do. So point one to all of you in the audience here, figure out what's you, how you want to use your degree, whether it's math or engineering or any other degree, as you start working. Because you're going to work a long time, so you want to be passionate about it. And if you love computer programming, I love you, because we can't live in this world without really effective programs. But if that's not you, like it wasn't me, figure out what is. And this was it. So I was lucky enough at this point to find an organization called the Center for Naval Analyses. And the Center for Naval Analyses, that's what they did. They did operations analysis. They pioneered operations analysis in this country starting in World War II. So I'd come to the right place. And the very first thing that happened is they came to me and they said, well, aren't you a double Aren't you an electric? You're a math person. You're not an electrical engineer. Well, I need you to work on radar problems and something called electronic warfare, which is ways that you can use signals to disrupt radar functions. So I didn't know anything about radars, and I didn't know anything about being a double E. So my boss gave me the radar handbook and said, OK, go off and study. So what did I think? If you can do the math, you can do anything. And sure enough, I taught myself an awful lot about how radars work. And I taught myself an awful lot about being a double E, to the point that my double E PhD boss was able to uh, let me work on, on the project. And that was great, because that was a really interesting project. And I had a fantastic set of experiences understanding radar, understanding electronic warfare, and combining that with my love of math and the design of experiments. Within a year after joining the Center for Naval Analyses, I was able to fly in B-52 aircraft taking data from their radar that was being messed with by electronic warfare to learn the effects and to see it in an experiment that I had participated in designing. I mean, I am a very young analyst at this point. This was an incredibly fantastic opportunity. So after I had that opportunity, then the same organization, the Center for Naval Analyses, sent me out to Miramar Naval Air Station, where I had an experience of being on scene there for a little over two years, where I was able to design a whole series of experiments to help the fighter community understand the impact of electronic warfare on their radars and their missile systems. Again, still in the Cold War. 
And so from that opportunity, I had the chance to go into another assignment where I was able to lead the analysis that the Center for Naval Analyses did for the Navy on the readiness of entire aircraft carrier strike groups to deploy at a time when the guys on those ships weren't sure if they were going to have to go into combat with the Soviet Union. So they were pretty scared. They, were, they had to be ready to go. And I had the privileged opportunity to lead a team of analysts over and over and over to go out on aircraft carriers and design the experiment that would test their readiness, go out, gather the data, assess the data, and understand First, whether they were ready, but then also how to help the next guys going through it have a better experience, learn more, and be even more ready. I couldn't have done any of these things without my math background. And so it was, it was really a fantastic opportunity. What I would tell you is that understanding what we couldn't say from this kind of work was as important as understanding what we could say. And I, I think that that again comes from that understanding of mathematics. But because, just because we couldn't say some things didn't mean that we didn't learn a lot from using creative analysis, understanding how to put the pieces together and having it all fall into place like a puzzle, and how to learn from the last experiment to better design the next. During this period, I was also um, applying my analytic skills to, um, to real world problems. I had more and more opportunities to lead that work. So um, my uh, leadership at CNA said, we want you to go into management. I didn't want to go into management. I loved doing this. This was really cool, and I loved doing it. But they convinced me that I could lead teams of analysts to go out and do aircraft carrier um, exercise analysis. I couldn't do that by myself, and that was absolutely true. And one of the things I'll just share with you through my years at CNA and since, frankly, is that even as you go into leadership opportunities, I at least have found that math and the practice of an analysis has helped me enormously as a leader. Because I think that leadership, there's a big component of it that is inspiring. And inspiration has to come from trust. And you get trust as a leader by being transparent and balanced, and at least for me, fact-driven. So sharing the information that I have as a leader with people, sharing the data, showing people the logic I've used to come to the decision I've made to try to motivate them to follow me has worked well. So even in, in leadership and management positions, I have found that math has played a role. So I had a fabulous career at the Center for Naval Analyses, and I actually left that organization as its president, which was a tremendous privilege. And I can guarantee you that when I was in school, the thought that I would ever get a position like that never, ever occurred to me. Um, so it was, it was a, great, a great time. Well, after I had been the president of CNA for several years, I had the opportunity to go into the Defense Department, to go into government. So CNA is a civilian organization that works very closely with the government, with the Defense Department, and particularly the Navy. I had an opportunity then to transition from a civilian position into an actual government position, a particular type of government position, a political appointment. And the political appointment that I had was to go in and be what's called the director of something, the cost assessment and program evaluation arm of the Secretary of Defense. So I went from this to this, OK? <laughs> the other was more fun, let me tell you, OK? This is the Defense Department's budget and um, over a period of years. And so the position of cost assessment and program evaluation is something called presidentially appointed, Senate confirmed. And that means I had to sit in front of a Senate panel, the Senate Armed Services Committee, and be questioned, friendly questioning not, of whether or not I was ready for this job, okay? I knew nothing about this. So the Secretary of Defense at the time was Secretary Gates. And he 
called me in for an interview, as you would, right, when you're going to hire somebody on your staff. And so it was, it was another one of those experiences where you're pinching yourself, right? It's, I never in my life expected to meet a Secretary of Defense, let alone be interviewed by one for a position. So I am in his office with his chief of staff, me, and the secretary, Secretary Gates. And he's talking all about his goals for the department and what he's done. And all of a sudden, in his, in his uh, stream of dialogue, he stops and he turns to me and he says, so why are you right for this job? I said, I don't think I am. <laughs> he said, yeah, I, I don't think anybody had said that in the DOD office before. And you probably shouldn't take this part of the advice. So anyway, but I did. I was I, honest. I, I didn't. I said, sir, I'm an operations analyst. I have not done program analysis like this. This is, that's not what I do. And I would never want to let you down. And he sat back. I'm sure I knocked the wind out of his sails. Anyway, but he looked at me and he said, you know, Christine, we are at war. So this was 2009. We had been in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2001 and 2003. So we had been at war a long time. So all those Cold War exercises I told you about, that was preparing for the eventuality of war. I had the opportunity to study real world operations at CNA through the time of Iraqi freedom, which was happened after September 11th, um, and the operations in Afghanistan. So I knew a lot about them. So he said, I think having somebody in this department that's an analyst who understands operations can only be a good thing. You'll learn the rest. So I'm thinking, Dad, please be right. Because <laughs> if you can do the math, you can do anything. I'm so, oh, brother. But, um, but I did have um, a wonderful set of experiences um, in the CAPE office. I was incredibly fortunate that the office is filled with analysts, many mathematicians, but also lots of engineers of all types. And, um, and they were very, very good at studying the acquisition program. So what is, what is this look like? I mean, this is the budget, right? But the decisions that the analysis that I, my office was responsible for, that I was responsible for, was to help the department's leadership make decisions like, should we buy a lot more of existing aircraft, or should we buy fewer new ones that are much more modern? And how do you make that trade-off? Or should we not buy any more airplanes at all, but should we buy more ships? Or should we buy some ships, but some tanks too? Or maybe we need more people, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. How do you make those really difficult trade-offs? And what is that? That's analysis, right? And in order to do that, you have to have data. You have to have facts, and you have to be able to put it together in a way that's analytically grounded, that's solid, that's defensible, so that I can give the Secretary of Defense that I worked for enough information that they could make the decisions and feel good about it, because they were the ones that had to testify that this budget that they submitted was going to meet the nation's needs and make sure that our Defense Department was ready for whatever may come. And that's, that's heady stuff, right? That's a, that's a big responsibility. So I was super, super happy that I had such a great and talented staff at CAPE. And I did pull on, if you can do the math, you can do anything. So I learned a lot again. I had a lot of going to school through my career and learning new things. One of the things, though, that I think I brought to CAPE that helped me help the secretaries that I worked for was the ability to tease out of all the analysis and all the information and all the data that pithy essence of what really matters. If you are the Secretary of Defense and you have to make this decision, you do not have years. You would have 30 minutes, I would get 30 minutes with the Secretary a few times a week as we built up to making the decisions behind that budget. Not a lot of time. And yet I had to give him the information that he needed to make the best decision possible. Not my decision. I helped him make a decision with analysis. It was his decision. And if, if I didn't give him enough information, believe me, they weren't very happy. So a lot of it was giving them just the right amount of information. And that's analysis. That's 
pulling on math. That's understanding how to pull out of the data the pithy essence, the most important thing. And I had the opportunity to do that five times for three different secretaries of defense. Secretary Gates is on the left, Secretary Panetta is in the middle, and Secretary Hagel on the right. Those are the three secretaries of defense that I worked for from 2009 to 2014. Each of them are really, really different people. Secretary Gates is very analytic. Secretary Panetta is just an incredibly brilliant man, but he's, he's an engager. He's, he's out. He's talking to people. He's, he's very um, interested in understanding, but he doesn't want to see graphs and charts. And Secretary Hagel's kind of in the middle. He'd tolerate a graph or a chart, but, but not very long. Had to kind of just use them judiciously. So I had to learn how to help the folks in CAPE and, and myself bring forward to these three very different people very different information so that they could make the best decisions that they could. Because I think CAPE was very good at doing that, like I said, I had just, there were such fantastic people there. We also got thrown our way during this period major strategic reviews for the department. In addition to figuring out the budget, it was tackling major issues that the department was struggling with on a more systemic basis. Things like, how can we be more efficient, right? It's a huge bureaucracy. Where can we cut the bureaucracy? I know that sounds easy and you read about it in the paper all the time. Oh, the Defense Department. Department, just cut the bureaucracy. You know, it takes a few people to run a department that big. The, the Department of Defense budget is about the 12th GDP in the world. Okay, it's equivalent. That, you know, it takes a few people to run a country, right? So you, it's not trivial to, to cut the bureaucracy. So again, a big challenging analytic task. Where can you make cuts? You know you can. You just got to find the right places to do it such that it actually improves the efficiency of the department but doesn't hurt the operation. So those are the kinds of reviews that I did. The last review that I had the opportunity to lead in the department as the director of CAPE was, I think, the most significant, which was called the Strategic Choices in Management Review. And it came at a time when the Congress decided it was going to precipitously cut the Depart Department of Defense's budget under something you may have heard of called sequestration. And if you haven't, don't worry about it. It was basically a big precipitous cut. And because the perception of the department was, oh, it's got lots of money. I showed you those big bar charts, right? Lots of money. Surely they can take this cut. No problem. It was hard to actually show people the actual impact of the cuts on the department. And that was my job, that was my task, was to work with CAPE and across the entire department to actually show where we could take the cuts and where it would bite into the effectiveness and the capabilities of our defense department. And I think we were successful because we actually were able to show to the department itself, but also the administration, and most importantly, the Congress, exactly where those cuts would, would hurt and why. And we, we did what I call a killer chart, which is another thing mathematics helps you learn how to do. It's that, that lean out the most important thing and communicate it really effectively. So graphics and presentation is really important and it is part of your analysis. It's part of your work. And we made a chart that kind of crystallized this. And I knew that I had been successful because I had an in-call with Senator Inhofe and he pulled that chart out of his pocket. He had had it shrunk and laminated. <laughs> and he said, I carry this around everywhere to show what we're doing to the Defense Department. I was like, yes, this is it, right? That was, that's, that's really good. So that's analysis and that's what, what math can do. Because of that review, I think that's why Secretary Hagel asked me to come in and serve as his Deputy Secretary of Defense, which I, I had the privilege to do for, for six months. And I know you, this is a a lot of Defense Department speak, so I just wanted to put this up to give you a sense of kind of what that meant, because it was kind of terrifying for me. It's the President, it's the Secretary of Defense, and it's the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Okay, that was me for, for six months, basically running the inside of the Defense Department. What it means to be the Deputy in a job like this is that all the really hard problems that nobody else can solve, they come to you unless the Secretary wants them. Then he peels them off, but you get all the rest, right? <laughs> That's what the Deputy Secretary is. It's not an analytic job. The CAPE job was an analytic job. This was not an analytic job. 
However, I found that I still brought analysis and my math background to even that job. Because what I found um, here, as I said that I had found as myself as, as a leader, is when you take facts and logic and apply it analytically and you can communicate it with that pithy essence and be transparent, all senior people, even if they hate what you're saying, and I had people that hated what I was telling them, they appreciate it. And it helps them make a better decision because you take the emotion out of it. You show them this is the facts. This is, this is what the logic says. If you disagree with this recommendation, what don't you like about these facts or this logic? And if they can't find anything, they kind of have to accept it. It helps you have a better conversation, a richer conversation. And I was able to pull on those skills that I had had a lot of scars by this point to learn how to, to do, even um, as the Deputy Secretary of Defense. So great privilege, great set of experiences, learned a lot, tons of sea stories. I'd be happy to tell you at the reception, but I decided that it was time for me after that experience to go back to an analytic position and in a place where I wanted to learn really new and interesting things. So I had the privilege of going to the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory where I, I am today. And so I, at APL, I get to work on so many incredible things. I get to work on space. I get to work on assured space operations. What's it going to be? Be like in the future with space so crowded and with increasing threats to our space systems from our potential adversaries. I get to work on the ethical implications of new technologies and, and, um, and technologies such as artificial intelligence and autonomy and robotics. This is a picture of the prosthetic limb. It's the most sophisticated prosthetic limb that has ever been made in the country, um, maybe the world, and it is controlled by your brain, brain computer interface can control that through um, invasive techniques, but we're working on non invasive techniques. It is a fantastic thing for all of our men and women who served in the military that were lost limbs in the last however long it's been now 17, 18 years um, since September 11th. But it also has ethical implications, and we're engaged in thinking about those. And I have the opportunity to think about big data analytics. If you don't think that today is the day of math and science and engineering, believe me, folks, it's a world where that, those skills are so very important. And big data and big data analytics applied to pretty much anything is a very powerful uh, capability today. And at APL, I get to actually help even apply those things to the area of health. Um, and figure out a way to make us healthier going forward and to find uh, diseases and focus on diseases um, more quickly. So amazing opportunities, still having them, still going to school, still hoping that you know if you can do the math you can do anything as I have to uh, learn about these amazing new technologies. Um, and I just kind of want to give you a few takeaways as I think, I think about this because um, I think as I've, I've thought about how math has helped me in my career and all the, the terrific opportunities I've had, I think the most important thing for those of you that are studying math and engineering is to understand that math applies broadly. It's not a set of rules that you just apply to any problem. It's a way of thinking. Math lays the groundwork for critical thinking. Now, I have to tell you the truth. I don't use complex mathematics now, and I haven't for a long time. Now, some of my colleagues still use complex mathematics, so I don't want to tell you there's no future career where you would continue to use them, but I haven't used them. I haven't used them because it's the thinking, the thought process, that critical thinking that math has given me, that has helped me analyze everything from fighter exercises to the Defense Department's budget and pretty much everything in between. What is critical thinking? What do I mean by that? Well, I think it is how to structure an unstructured problem. 
So most of the problems I talked to you about were pretty unstructured problems. How do you even go about thinking about some of those? Well, my math background helped me start to tease that apart, peel back the onion. Okay, I don't know the answer to this big thing, but I can figure out the answer to this piece of it. And that'll tie to another piece and another piece. And before you know it, you've got some insights into the bigger problem. That's using my math background, and my colleagues uh, do it as well, to structure an unstructured problem. And then you do have to have facts. You do have to find data. I like data the best, but sometimes it's a question that doesn't have data. It doesn't mean you're not applying my math background. Just because I'm not computing something doesn't mean that critical thinking isn't allowing me to tackle a problem that doesn't have data. But it still has facts still has information, and I can find that information, and I can still apply rigorous logic to it. I think it is also about creativity. You need to be creative as you think critically about how to put these facts together and use them and use your understanding of mathematics as you put them together to see how far your information can take you and how far it can't, what you can't say. If I had to give the Secretary of Defense information that he had to defend in a hostile hearing, I didn't want to tell him something that really wasn't defensible. My goodness, that would have been so incredibly irresponsible. Well, I had to know that line, and I had to help the Secretary understand that line. And, and that's another part of critical thinking. But mostly, I think critical thinking is about solving puzzles. And there's so many puzzles out there. And it, it's, it's a way to think about solving puzzles, which is, is really wonderful. So it, it's not obvious how you do this. It's, uh, you have to learn how to do it. You have to try it. You have to fail. Um, and you have to learn from that. And you have to try again. But I want to tell you that I think the way that you, you learn is by doing research, by actually doing it. And I know that you have opportunities here to do research. And I just want to encourage you that you're going to learn how to do this in the real world faster if you take advantage of research opportunities now. So I encourage you to take every opportunity to do research. So one last point. I've had wonderful opportunities. I loved every minute of it. But as I think back on my, um, my education and I think back on kind of what it felt like to be where you are in your education, I think there is one thing I wish I had thought about a little differently might not have changed what I did. I, I loved going to George Mason and I got an excellent education. But I didn't even think about other options. I didn't think about other options because I didn't come from a background where I had my parents, we didn't have any money. And so it was an, an education that we could afford. And it was just kind of assumed that I would go to George Mason. So really didn't even think about applying other places. So my husband is from a similar economic background, but he grew up in Andover, Massachusetts. He's a PhD physicist from Brown. He got his education by applying for tuition assistance and scholarships, and he ended up going Ivy League. The thought that I could go Ivy League hadn't occurred to me. So it's just something that I, I just didn't know. I didn't know about. And I know from just talking tonight to you, you have wonderful, wonderful support here um, at Howard County. And I think that you have the opportunity to get access to, um, to tuition assistance and scholarships and how to apply for them. Just think about it, because honestly, it's a big world out there. And I've had a lot of opportunity to, to travel the, this, the country and to travel the, the world at this point. But that started later for me than it might have if I had thought just a little differently about it. Again, I'm not sure I would have made a different decision. But I didn't even consider it. And I, I think that was something that I, I wish I had, I had done. So I just want to close by saying that I hope that I've convinced you that you are extremely lucky to be studying math um, or any of the STEM fields. I think this is an exciting time to be in STEM fields. Uh, I think technology is booming in exciting and sometimes very challenging ways. And so it's an important area to be working in. I think what you want to think about as you use your math is be inquisitive. 
don't just accept things that somebody sends you in a text or uh, you see on social media or that you see even in the paper. Just be inquisitive, question, use critical thinking. And, and that comes from your math. As you practice your, your critical thinking, understand that math is a wonderful um, set of, of interesting academic uh, learning that you can apply broadly. It's not a, just a set of tools. And I sometimes see mathematicians coming out of certain programs that they kind of have the view that the, the tools they learned in school are hammers and the whole world's a nail. And they just go all over the world looking for nails. I guarantee you there were no nails, any of the problems that I talked to you about. Everyone required a different approach, a different thought process, a different way to do things, but every one of them pulled on my math background. So don't um, go around looking for nails. Um, but mostly I would tell you to enjoy math. Enjoy the math in your life, have fun with it, recognize what it does for you, how it gives you such wonderful opportunities to think differently and to solve puzzles and frankly, change the world. And I wish that for all of you. So thank you so much, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you.